Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to see everybody in, and again, for benefit of our TV audience, we've got people from all over the country here with us today. I haven't got time to list them all, but anyway, you'll probably see a lot of new faces that you haven't seen over the years, and so again, we just want to welcome all you folks that have come from so far. And again, for those of you in television, if you're a new listener, we're not associated with any group. I'm not a pastor of a church. I'm just a cattle rancher, but we love to teach the book and the Lord has given me the opportunity to do this and so we don't uh, we don't try to attack anybody we don't try to elevate anybody we just simply try to get people and it's working isn't it honey my if you could read our mail it's working people are saying for the first time in my life I'm understanding what this book is all about well what more could we ask and uh, so that's our whole purpose in teaching is to help folks to put all this together all right again we have to thank you for all your prayers and your letters and of course your financial help we don't want to forget that but uh, keep, keep praying for force because the devil doesn't like what we're doing. We're, we are under satanic attack and I think most of you realize that. All right, now I'm going to continue on what we started in the last two tapings or the last eight programs and that is more or less Jerry titled it, connecting the dots, didn't you? Jerry titled it for me. We're connecting the dots and you know I, I came up with that at one of my seminars, and I think it might have been the one in Oklahoma City a year ago, where I don't know how many people used the same expression on their way out. And they said, Les, today is the first time somebody connected the dots. Well, you know what that means. When you just simply get all the subject matter tied together so that it makes sense. Well, this is what we uh, hope to do, and we started with the previous eight programs way back in Genesis, and we came up through then the Old Testament and the promises as we see in the verse we're going to open up with, Romans 15, verse 8. So for those of you in television, the studio has got to jump on you. I gave him the verse before we opened. So find Romans 15, verse 8, and I just called it to the audience here, the introduction to the book of Matthew. And you say, Paul <laughs> introducing Matthew? Well, in reality it does. Here it is, Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was. Now naturally, that's past tense from when Paul is writing. So Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. That's Israel, remember. So he was a minister of the nation of Israel for the truth of God. Wasn't something Paul dreamed up. But for the truth of God to confirm or fulfill the promises made to the fathers. Now, if you think about that for a minute, isn't that the perfect introduction to the four Gospels? Well, for most people, it doesn't mean that at all. But it should. Because, you see, as we ended up in our last program, I think the last verse I used was Zechariah 14, verse 8, if I'm not mistaken. For the Lord, God the Son, Jehovah, shall be king over all the earth. And very few in Christendom understand that. They don't know what we're talking about. So we have to just patiently keep repeating and repeating. And it finally sinks in. All right, so look at the verse again. That Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry was, years before Paul writes, a minister, a sent one, a particular instrument that God used between himself and the nation of Israel. Israel, God sent him to Israel for what purpose? You know what most people say? Well, to go to the cross. No, the cross hasn't even been mentioned yet. There's no inkling of a cross except in Psalms 22, and maybe if you've got a lot of imagination, Isaiah 53, but the cross was unknown in the Old Testament prophets. They didn't know he was going to go to a Roman crucifixion, but what did they know? He was coming to be a king over a kingdom. And so all the prophets 
And that's what we've showed in the previous eight programs, how that all the prophets were depicting a glorious earthly kingdom over which Israel is going to be the major player, they'll be the major nation on earth, because Jesus Christ will be the King of kings and Lord of lords. All right, that was the promise made to the nation of Israel. That not only would they be a favored nation, but the day would come when they could enjoy God himself in the role of the Son, who would be their Messiah and King, and Israel would be the top dog of all the nations. That's what the Old Testament prophets are all about. All right, now we're going to look at how it began to unfold then. He came to fulfill the promises. Now come back with me to Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> we touched a little bit in previous programs the announcement to Joseph and Mary of this virgin-born son that was coming. We also alluded to John the Baptist and his parents and how John the Baptist's father recognized through the leading of the Holy Spirit that this was the favored son to announce the coming of Israel's Messiah. And so this is where we're going to start now. John the Baptist is now full grown and he's beginning his ministry to the nation of Israel. Now I'm going to emphasize it all afternoon. Whom or to whom did Christ come? Israel. Israel. And now next, no, this month already, we're in November. In fact, I was just thinking when I was back there having my private prayer time, I think I should encourage everyone in my listening audience, you call the White House. And you can find the number. It's available, everybody. You call the White House and ask for the comment line. I do it periodically. It'll just be an opportunity to leave a 40-second recording. Well, it won't take 40 seconds to you just admonish our president, don't force Israel to give away one acre of land. That's all you have to say. And if we bombard the comment line with that kind of a statement, I'm sure he's going to have the wherewithal to think twice, because that's what it's all going to be about. See, he and Condoleezza Rice want to give back the East Jerusalem and some of the West Bank, and uh, I just say it flies in the face of the promises of God, except that it probably has to happen for the end time scenario, and I guess you're all aware that we're getting close. But nevertheless... Christ came to the nation of Israel. John puts it this way. He came unto his own Israel, and his own received him not. All right, now in Matthew chapter 3, we have the beginning then of the ministry of John the Baptist, who is really an Old Testament prophet. In fact, sorry about this, honey, back up a few pages to Malachi. Just go back to Malachi chapter 3. Because some of these preachers and theologians get all riled up with me when I make this statement that the four Gospels are just an extension of the Old Testament. The only thing that's changed is that the Messiah is in their midst. Nothing has changed. They're still the, the nation of Israel. They're still worshiping at the temple. And uh, they're resting on the Old Testament covenant promises. Nothing has changed. So I make no apology. The four Gospels are an extension of the Old Testament. Now look at Malachi. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, the prophet writes, I will. Now whenever I use those words, I will, in the Old Testament, what do I put on it? The promise. That's a promise of God. He's going to do it. And as I wrote to someone just this morning, any time you have a prophetic statement from the lips of the God himself, I will, you mark it down, it is going to happen. It may take a couple more thousand years. I don't think so. But even if it does, it's going to happen. Anything that God says, I will do, is going to to happen. Have I made my point? Because most of Christendom scorns this anymore. They're throwing out prophecy by the truckload. They don't want anything to do with it. And I beg to differ. All right. Now look what God says through the prophet Malachi 400 years before it happens. 
I will send my messenger, a reference to John the Baptist, and he shall prepare the way before me. That's what John the Baptist did. And the Lord, God the Son, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. Did he? Of course he did. All right. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now verse 2. Who may abide the day of his coming? Now again, i got to stop. Who do the Old Testament prophets write to? Israel, the Jew. Now watch this. But who may abide the day of his coming to the nation of Israel? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Now what's the analogy? How do you purify gold or silver or mercury or any of the heavy metals? Heat. Heat. The more you heat it, the more the impurities come to the top, see? And so that's the analogy here, that this is what God is going to do with his covenant people, Israel. It's going to be cleansing them like a refiner's fire or a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi. Now, who were the sons of Levi? The priesthood, the religious leaders, see? See? And he will purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. I will come near to you in judgment and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, the false teachers, the adulterers and against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow, the fatherless, and those that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. All right, now there's the Old Testament promise of a coming herald or announcer of the Messiah. And remember, it was 400 years before it happened. That was the last word that God gave Israel before he spoke to Joseph and Mary and Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. All right, but now John the Baptist begins his ministry. Back to Matthew chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And this was his sermon. This was his message. Repent ye... For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now again, I'm gathering from the letters and phone calls I get that 90% of Christendom does not have a clue what this kingdom of heaven really is. They think it's some kind of a spiritual entity, something up there in the ethereal. No, the kingdom of heaven is a literal, physical, and as I mentioned the last taping, political kingdom. Christ is going to rule and reign as a legitimate king. And whenever a king rules, there's politics involved. Not the rotten kind we're used to, but you have to control the masses. And how do you do that? With political laws and rules and so forth. All right, now, sometimes I don't know where I'm going to go next. I guess this is one of them. Jump ahead a minute. Jump ahead to Matthew chapter... 19, verse 27. Now maybe you think it doesn't connect, but on the other hand, I think it will. So do you see what I'm talking about? That we're talking about a kingdom over which a government will hold sway. All right? Matthew 19 verse 27. We're at the end of the three years of his earthly ministry. And Peter is speaking. 
And answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we, the twelve, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Now put that in the realm of present day politics. And it's real easy to explain. If you're going to support someone running for office, and you're going to put a lot of time and energy and maybe even some money in it, what are you going to expect in return? Well, come on, you're all normal humans. You're going to want to be a place in his administration. I want a job. I don't care what it is, but if I'm going to work for you and you win, I want a job. Okay, fair enough. That's what Peter is saying. Lord, we've been with you for three years. Now when you come and set up your kingdom, where are we going to be? Are we going to be janitors? <laughs> no, no. Oh, no. Look what the answer was. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, well, when is that? The kingdom. When he sets up his earthly kingdom in the capital in Jerusalem. And this is the prospect for the twelve. Of course, Judas lost his. Matthias comes in. But it's still the twelve. All right? So when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, in that regenerated, reconstituted, remade earth like unto the Garden of Eden, we've been stressing that over the last several months, all right, now where are the twelve going to be? You also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging or ruling the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, is that gobbledygook? That's plain English. Where are they going to be? They're going to be under the throne room there in Jerusalem, and all twelve men are going to have a distinctive tribal relationship with one of the tribes ruling under the king. Now, is that so hard to see? And it's as plain as English can make it. That's what it's going to be. Christ is going to be the king of kings and Lord of lords, but under him are going to be the twelve apostles, each with one of the twelve tribes as their jurisdiction. See? All right, now speaking of the king, let's go all the way back to Isaiah. We may have used it in the last two tapings, but let's look at it again because I've got to convince the doubters that we're talking about a literal, physical, political kingdom. Isaiah chapter 9, I think it is. I hope it is. Isaiah 9. Verse 6 and 7. Now, if this doesn't fit what we're talking about, land, I don't know what does. But this is written 700 years before the Matthew prophecy. But it still fits. It's the Word of God. You know, when we were down in Georgia the other day, I don't know how many people said what our ministry has done for them. It's just like putting the jigsaw puzzle together that when you've got everything as it should be, they all fit. Well, that's the way this book is. If you get it all put together, it fits. See? All right. Verse 6, Isaiah 9. For unto us, the nation of Israel, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. That was the whole purpose of Christ coming to the nation of Israel in Bethlehem. And the government, see? The government shall be upon his shoulder. Who? The son that was given, that was born in Bethlehem. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be, when he becomes this glorious king, it'll be wonderful, consular, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. In other words, no enemy is ever going to come in and upset it. And it shall be upon the throne of David. And that's why I always put it where? Mount Zion. Just south of the 
Temple Mount that you see in the news all the time lately, about a quarter of a mile south, down a little bit, was Mount Zion. And that's where his throne is going to be. And that's where the 12 will have their 12 thrones, see? All right, so it's going to be where the uh, throne of David existed, and uh, he's going to order it, <clears throat> and he's going to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth forever. In other words, that kingdom is going to slip right on into eternity, I think, on the new heaven and the new earth that we see in Revelation 21. All right, now then, let's come back quickly. My goodness, time is almost gone. Back to Matthew chapter 3. So here comes John the Baptist, the heralder, the announcer, that the king is in their midst. Consequently, what's the message? Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, now, why was repentance the prerogative? Because it's going to be a sinless kingdom. And Israel had to get righteously right with their Messiah before the kingdom could be brought in. The sin problem had to be dealt with. You don't hear much about sin anymore, do we? No matter how vile everything gets, they never call it sin. But you see, Israel had the same sins that we got today. They were listed when we were back there in Malachi. They robbed the widows. They committed adultery. They were everything. Well, they had to repent of all that and be ready for this glorious king and his kingdom. All right, verse 3. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, I didn't look at Isaiah. I looked at Malachi. I could have taken you also back to Isaiah, but I didn't for sake of time. But this is how Isaiah put it. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now, maybe I can clarify it a little bit and change the, preparation, uh, the preposition. Prepare ye the way for the Lord. Get ready for him. He's coming, see? All right? Make his path straight. In other words, let his ministry come to full fruition, like Romans 15, 8 said, that he could fulfill the promises made to the fathers. All right, now then, come on across the page to chapter 3, verse 11. Not only were they to recognize who Jesus was, but now they had another prerequisite. They had to follow this repentance with water baptism. Boy, that makes everybody smile, doesn't it? Nothing makes me better, feel better when I agree with water baptism. <laughs> well, for these Jews, it was appropriate. Of course it was. My goodness, I got time. Come all the way back with me to Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Because we've got to make all of this make sense. I'll never forget, it's quite a few years ago now, I was at a funeral. And as I was walking back to my car, one of the pastors in the community, he's gone on to be with the Lord now. He was walking the other way, and he just yelled across the street. He said, Les, I watch you every morning. And I, I was shocked. I, and you don't disagree? He says, how can I? He says, you prove everything from the book. Well, that's what I like to hear. All right, now here's my take. Why did these Jews need repentance and water baptism? Well, I should have even gone one chapter further. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> Keep your hand in Leviticus. Go back to Exodus 19. Here's where it all begins. I'm sorry about that. But people who know how I teach, it doesn't bother them. So I hope nobody out there cares. Exodus 19, verse 6. Israel is just out of Egypt, gathered around Mount Sinai. And in chapter 20, God is going to give Moses the Ten Commandments. So we got the nation ready for the law. But before they give the law, look what God promises again. Exodus 19, verse 6. And you, the nation of Israel, you shall be unto me a kingdom. See? A kingdom with a king but there to be a kingdom of priests. Every Jew a priest of Jehovah. Not just Levi, every Jew. 
was going to be a go-between. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. All right, now come back to Leviticus. If they're going to be a priest of Jehovah, like the Levites, what are they all going to have to go through? Water washing. Now Leviticus chapter 8. Verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron. Now he was the first high priest, if you remember. Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, two rams and a basket of unleavened bread. Gather thou all the congregation together to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded. All right, now then, verse 5. And Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. Now this is the first time. See, this is the beginning of Israel's religious history. Verse 6. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and what? Washed them with what? Water. And that was the whole idea of preparation for the priesthood. Now, as Judaism went up through the years, then you see, it just became a ritual where the priests would be constantly washing, 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 see, in the water. In fact, one time I was and I were down, way down in the lower parts of ancient Jerusalem. And we had an archaeologist guide and he was showing us what they thought had been the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. Seven bathrooms. Seven. But they weren't just bathrooms, they were ritual baths. For what? That constant cleansing, cleansing, cleansing. All right, so now then, got one minute left. Come back to Matthew 3. So if Israel is going to be a nation of priests, what is every Jew going to have to use as an introductory rite? Water. Baptism. See? And that's the way it's translated in the book of Hebrews. Washings. Washings. But the Greek word is baptizo. See, so the two are synonymous. When you wash, you baptize. When you baptize, you have a, a uh, symbolic Washing. All right, so just quickly now, and then we've got to wind it down. Where John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with water? No, with the Holy Spirit and fire. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.